designed for crossing the chasm. Tools, examples, and integration. Hello, my name is Joshua Gigantino. I'm a Master of Science and Design candidate at Arizona State University. From a design perspective, chasms often have huge policy, financial, or marketing hurdles aside from any design or engineering issues. Chasms exist across cultures in that a practice or artifact fits into one but not the other culture. Chasms also exist for products that are technically feasible but unimplemented. Sometimes these are small hurdles, sometimes these are very large hurdles. Um, they vary between subject matter and project, but they definitely exist. So the question is, who is a designer? There are a lot of potential answers. Uh, one of the best answers given is in the 1950s by the computer scientist and psychologist Herbert Simon. He says, everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. This uh, pushes out the boundaries away from just visual thinking and visual processing to a whole range of activities, but also invites those activities into traditional hands-on visual-based design practice. So some typical fields in design that you will find at a school like RISD or Arizona State or Pratt, you'll find graphic design, industrial design, architecture, landscape, a UI UX, which are user interface and user experience, perhaps transport design, very popular in Detroit, or exhibit design. Each of these fields also is experiencing certain levels of specialization at this point. So some atypical fields that you'll find inside each of those are you'll find community engagement specialists out of graphic designers. You'll find sustainability specialists in industrial design. You'll find urban planners emerging out of architecture schools. So what is design? Design will use several tiers of um, visual thinking and problem solving to improve outcomes and create new things and new devices and artifacts and processes. <clears throat> Design follows a hierarchy that Buchanan describes um, as moving from symbolic systems or functions in, in visual communication to the material artifacts of products up to a level of organized services and activities in systems and beyond that complex networks of networks or systems of systems that form communities. And so design can function between these levels, between these in among this hierarchy, and you can see different um, different schools of design. Uh, you know, of graphic design versus industrial design. Graphic design will function more in these symbolic and visual communications, whereas industrial design will function more in the product level. Um, an architect will be working at the system and product level, for instance, most of the time. Um, Ideally, any designer can function at all four of these levels comfortably inside their own skill set. Um, Professor Boridkar uh, at ASU describes design as having three components. Um, the components are uh, be beauty, uh, utility, and sustainability, and typically in this context, designers are going to try and balance all three of those elements. Uh, in balancing them, they will hopefully come up with a usable and uh, sustainable and aesthetic device. So some trends in design. Design is moving from an end of process or afterthought on a project into a core strategic tool in the enterprise. Um, design can be um, um, design can be compared to an avocado, where back in the old days it was um, 
sort of the seed of the avocado down in the center, the last thing kind of touched in a project. And now, as it's moving into the strategic realm, it's more like the skin of the avocado. And it's the, the first thing, and it's part of the process throughout the, throughout the project. Design is increasingly emphasizing collaboration um, and sustainability. And by collaboration, that can be interdisciplinary teams of people with very different specialties, all the way through transdisciplinary teams where team members are gaining new skills from each other and creating new knowledge. Design helps facilitate that whole process. Um, as far as sustainability goes, sustainability is the radical notion that we don't want to choke on our own fumes and design is hopefully leading the way on that um, because designers choose materials and choose all sorts of other features um, in the the artifacts and you know materials that they generate that we have a responsibility uh, similar to how engineers would have a responsibility as far as picking recyclable materials and making sure that what we're using is you know as good for the earth and society as possible design can be a messy process um, especially design research there's usually ambiguity about answers often right up until the end of the project um, it doesn't it shouldn't detract from what design provides it's just that handling such complex questions that go between people and culture and technology tends to leave things up in the air for a while. So there are three main interest areas to look at as far as design goes. There's design research, design thinking, and design practice. Most of what people think about of design is typically design practice, but research and thinking um, tools are as critical as the hands-on making tools in the overall process of design. So design research helps us ask the right questions, look at problems in mul from multiple viewpoints, and come to uh, conclusions um, from research, you know, from, from study-based questions. Design thinking um, is more about getting people together in groups and um, come to decision making. It, it is also an individual process, but typically the individual process is going to be rolled into either research or practice. Um, it is design thinking really shines when it's large groups of people. Design practice is the wealth of tools um, from drawing to 3D modeling um, that make up visual, uh, visual problem solving. So this brings us to design research. Design research began in the 50s and 60s as a way to find evidence-based decisions that relate to design. Uh, it uses uh, anthropologic techniques, primarily ethnographic study. It uses some statistics, psychology uh, techniques, and other techniques from the social sciences, along with uh, design techniques, especially visual thinking techniques, to come to uh, new design decisions. Uh, this uses a process called triangulation, primarily, where you look at a problem from multiple viewpoints. Um, this can be either when you actually do the study on the problem to do radically different studies to get um, different answers coming in from different directions. This can be having very different people on the team. So design research teams are always as diverse as possible for just this reason so that you get very um, strong multiple viewpoints uh, across the spectrum of people that are available on the project. Uh, we, we refer to the um, answers, uh, especially the ethnographic answers, as thick descriptions. 
because often they are um, just the one case, if you will, um, or the 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 best solution comes out of some happy accident. Uh, but these thick descriptions are very valid. So an example of this would be IDO and their revamping of the Walgreens clinic shopping pharmacy experience. So IDO in 2010 built an entire mock Walgreens pharmacy in a warehouse space and invited people to come in and function as pharmacy shoppers for a period of time. They then analyzed reconfigured and kept doing it until they came up with a, a new form of pharmacy experience that Walgreens was very happy with and they saw as more of a move towards a um, clinical and health maintenance or preventative care model and they see that as a trending topic. So um, you, you, you can expect to see these rolling out or something similar rolling out in Walgreens across the country soon. So design thinking um, is a team-based process um, that creates cohesive teams quickly. Uh, it also is primarily used for facilitating decision making in large groups. There, um, there are a range of design thinking exercises and techniques. Um, some of them, they can be as simple as sound ball or uh, the lining up and everybody in the line pretending to be components of a machine uh, to very sophisticated techniques that generate statistical data um, while helping um, people express their ideas. Design thinking um, encourages people to switch modes in terms of thinking. One technique that's very well known is the six hats technique. This is Edward uh, de Bono's technique of having six colored hats that each color represents a style of thinking so that um, the white hat, for instance, is available resources right now. The um, green hat is creativity. The red hat is passion about the project. The black hat is the devil's advocate. These help people look at problems, going back to the design research context, these help people look at problems from different perspectives. Um, in terms of interpersonal work, um, one thing that's nice with design thinking is techniques for um, empathic interviewing that help bring out answers uh, from people, you know, kind of unexpected answers from people. Um, it also helps designers or engineers or journalists or anybody working with designers to see things from new directions and new vantage points. Um, one of the m main things that design thinking provides on a strategic level is coordination and another is this ongoing process of engagement either in the community or across teams in the enterprise. So one example of a design thinking exercise is soundball. This is a technique that the D school at Stanford uses. And the technique's very simple. You stand around in a circle. One person creates a pretend ball and they throw it towards someone else while making a sound. And the other person has to catch it making a related sound and then throw it to another person. It usually involves just looking at people, so people have to pay attention to each other's faces, and it helps warm people up very well. So design practice is the normal, the, the, the normal perceived form of design, the visual thinking and making uh, of artifacts. 
it's good for producing one-off uh, prototypes and demonstrative uh, objects, and it's also good for producing final objects. Uh, these are usually handmade versus mass manufactured, but they can lend themselves towards mass manufacture later on. Studio design or design practice is the root of most of the built environment. So all the advertising, the shapes of all the objects that are not natural that you see from the Coke bottle to the bevel of plastic on the bus that you ride to school in, everything in that context in the built environment has had some kind of design applied to it. It's also had engineering applied to it and hopefully it's had some safety testing, but it's all been through the hands of a designer. Someone ideally thought about every curve that you're looking at and the feel of every material you touch. And all of that goes back to design practice as a burgeoning field. Um, this can be everything from a graphic designer laying pages out to an industrial designer um, shaping the skin of a cell phone to a product designer looking at the entire software and physical stack and the business case and all of that rolls into this studio practice. So let's look at some products that have already crossed the chasm. These can be um, category breakout, these can be achieving next levels of functionality, and then we'll look at some things whose time haven't come. So one item that has crossed the chasm, yeah, it, and this is an internal chasm inside Apple's technical culture, uh, is the iPad and iOS devices. So in the 90s, as you can see on the left, Apple had a, a marvelous tablet computer platform, personal digital assistant called the Newton. When Steve Jobs came back into power, uh, he axed the Newton product um, for various reasons, and for a long time there was no replacement. Uh, along comes the, the touch version of the iPods, and then the iPhone, and then the iPad, and 10 years ish, 10 ish years later, we have a relatively decent replacement for the Newton. So bike shares are a increasingly common feature in uh, large urban environments. Um, Bixie is a model of it. Uh, Bixie is in Montreal. They brought together everybody in the community that needed to be. And despite the snow and everything in that region, they've created hundreds of bicycle stations that you can easily take bikes all around the urban core. Uh, similar similar projects uh, have shown up in Boston, New York with the city bikes. Um, Phoenix is getting the green grid bike soon, and this is a trend everywhere. I everywhere there is dense housing and living situations. So sometimes these sort of trendy design things actually equal cold hard cash and that's something that corporations really love. So in the late 90s Ford needed to rethink the River Rouge facility which at one time was the largest single factory in the world and had kind of diversified um, into the 90s. But what they did was they let the architect and sustainability expert William McDonough, who has written the book Cradle to Cradle, redesigned the, the parts of the facility. And one of the things he did was put a green roof on the truck plant. And this green roof eliminates um, the need for water treatment plants. They also put some more water remediation at ground level as well. And so what happens is it costs about a third 
of what a water treatment plant would cost to put the green roof in. It costs less in chemicals every year. Um, so it eventually more than pays for itself. And then it also produces habitat for birds. It produces um, clean water. Like the water that comes off the roof is cleaner than the water that hits the roof. It also provides a thermal sink to make the actual buildings more comfortable uh, during the workday. So another example of the chasm crossed is the footprint chronicles. Patagonia Clothes, uh, like most large manufacturers, has a global supply chain uh, along with its somewhat global customer base. Um, and in an effort to kind of capture that, um, Patagonia has the footprint chronicles on their website so that you can see um, you, you can see where your clothes come from. You can get an idea where they're sewn and you can kind of keep track of it and you can learn about new sustainable or responsible materials that they're bringing about. So GPS is another consumer th item that um, piece of consumer infrastructure that has crossed a chasm. It started as um, tracking signals for the U.S. military, uh, primarily for guiding submarines, but also later on smart weapons. And when access to the GPS system was enabled for civilians um, from the 80s onward, it has seen increasing use uh, first, as, first as a surveyor's tool and for ships and other uses, uh, aircraft, and then later on um, in everybody's cell phone and nav units on cars and fleet maintenance and tracking devices and all sorts of other uses. Um, GPS is a real um, success story if you will, in terms of this kind of chasm crossing. So there's some items that you could describe as crossing the chasm right now. Um, I'll give a couple of examples from personal spaceflight through technology and home use. So one great example in the convergence of high tech down to the sort of garage level is the CubeSat. CubeSats are a 10 centimeter on a side, uh, one kilogram cubic satellites. They're very tiny. They are so small that they have surprising amounts of cap capacity and capability. Um, these tiny satellites were built originally by Bob Twiggs of um, Cal Polytech. Um, they're very simple, cheap. Uh, somewhat disposable, typically over the lifespan in months instead of years. One example, um, <clears throat> one example of these kind of satellites is Brown's Equisat system. Uh, the Equisat system will flash uh, flash bulbs or, or LED flashes when it is in darkness uh, above the Earth, so that people can see it from the ground. Another um, trending topic, if you will, is suborbital spaceflight. There's at least two contenders right now, um, and by contenders, they're in the process of drop or flight tests, not talking about it. Uh, these two are Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 uh, and XCOR's Lynx spacecraft. They're both suborbital space planes um, with tourist flights in the... Um, hundred to $250,000 range. Um, there, this has been something people have been working on for years and it's just starting to take off. There's some high kind of design elements to this in that Virgin's very famous for their experience design and they want this to be something that very, very high end clients really love and keep coming back to. And that's more than just a bare bones engineering project. Um, and it's much more than just a marketing sell-sell kind of project as well. 
Um, another thing that seems to be crossing uh, specifically in 2013 and into 2014 is Google Glass and other types of wearable computing. Uh, for years, we've had these um, sensors that you can put in your Nike shoes that will tell you your running, running technique um, and other devices like that and earlier wearable systems that were very bulky. And here comes Google Glass, which is just kind of a frame that you can kind of wear over your glasses. It can record uh, camera images. It can show you important information at the nod of a head. Um, another similar um, category, you know, in the same category device is Athos uh, Athletic Wear. Um, it has embedded sensors that track your movements and your output and all your body vitals and can relay them to you uh, so that you can tell at, at what, you know, what level of performance that you're functioning at. Um, back again, 20 years later, uh, we have desktop virtual reality. Um, as you can see from the... Um, from the bottom, people have been putting displays on their faces for a long time. On the left, you have Steve Mann's wearable computing. Uh, he's at the University of Toronto now. In the center, you have Jaron Lanier with uh, iPhones and data gloves from, it would look like, the mid-90s, um, and showing that not much has changed since then. In some ways, you have the Oculus Rift which is the hot new thing, but is also part of this much longer trend of VR headsets for the desktop. So 3D printing is another uh, trending item that's crossing the chasm uh, as far as being able to print at home. Um, the, the printers for a long time have been so expensive that they're work group level cost. So you find them at school shops or uh, fab lab or rentable maker spaces, but typically not in people's homes until the consumer electronics show in 2013. And there were dozen, dozens of relatively affordable 3D printers. So some of the things you can do now on the left, there's uh, Ninja Flex, flexible 3D printable material. Um, in the center is a Replicator 2 printing some kind of matrix. And on the right is a little boy with a deformed hand using a 3D printed um, prosthetic hand that while not as advanced as many others is also very, very, very affordable and provides a certain level of functionality that he wouldn't have had before. And that is the type of thing that is printable and makeable at home now. Um, another trending, uh, trending item would be the Nest digital thermometer. This is a thermometer that learns your patterns and learns when you're home and when you're gone and how hot and cold you want it and adjusts your temperatures accordingly. This company was recently purchased by Google for several billion dollars and it just shows that they really think this is gonna take off. So let's look at some things that need help crossing the chasm. These are items that um, exist in other cultural contexts. The um, functionality of them in those contexts isn't in debate, and the question is why haven't these things taken off here in the U.S.? So I'll be covering everything from uh, kneeling task chairs um, to residential solar hot water and fission reactors. Um, first up, we have the knee chair, or the Swedish chair, as it's sometimes called. It's almost exclusively used in the U.S. as a specialty injured back or trying to prevent back injury at computers task chair. Um, 
in Sweden, it's a fairly standard chair. It's used in schools. It, um, as you can see from the graphic, it provides nearly perfect body alignment, and it also provides core strengthening while you're sitting. Another item also from Europe um, is the float spa. So these are sensory deprivation tanks um, that have m mood lighting and music, and you float in a bath of 1,200 pounds of magnesium salts. It's rejuvenating for the skin. It's meditative. Um, and for some reason, there's only a half dozen of these facilities in the U.S. Um, another chasm is the, at least in the U.S., is a lack of a diesel-powered light vehicle fleet. Pictured is a Toyota Hilux. It's the same as a Toyota Tacoma, except that it uses a diesel engine. Um, they're better on mileage. They're better for the slightly better for the environment than gasoline. Um, but for some reason, there there's a resistance in the U.S. to diesel-powered consumer cars. A TDI uh, type car is always the exception, not the rule here. Another chasm that can be crossed is uh, more on the product and sales side. Um, this is this would be a design issue, but I'm not sure how much it would be an engineering issue. But how do you get Americans to buy what we would see as warm milk and room temperature eggs? So if milk is ultra pasteurized, it's perfectly fine on a shelf. Um, and it requires no refrigeration and eggs eggs in the US are pressure washed so that they lose their natural shellac um, so they need to be refrigerated to keep any bacteria down whereas in at least in Europe eggs are left unwashed and just brushed off and they maintain the shellac and they maintain their safety um, but we have a, if you will, an embedded infrastructure here in the U.S. of milk belongs in the fridge and eggs right alongside with it. And how do you how do you get past that? And is it something in terms of sustainability, or is there a business case that can be made for it? So residential hot water from the sun, the solar hot water, is another trending option that hasn't really taken off in the US. You'll see it once in a while on some roofs and sometimes in large installations even, but usually a hot water is created with natural gas fired or oil fired or some other boiled system. Um, a good example, about 90% of the homes in Israel use solar hot water systems. So last chasm that's design and design and engineering oriented to talk about today is fast breeder fission reactors uh, both the um, loop style that are there's a few that are functioning in the world and the um, mystical unicorn of all nuclear reactor designs the thorium um, thermal cycle uh, fission breeder um, these hold tremendous promise as far as um, energy production, and yet there's always something holding them back. So, where would you know, design and design in this context would probably be architecture and uh, product development and engineers. Obviously, you'd have like nukes involved, but you'd have mechies as well. Um, how do you take something like this and make it even safer and publicly acceptable in such a way that we can have all sorts of energy uh, available from it? So now I'm going to cover a few uh, items that need much more help crossing the chasm. Um, first among those is the solar power satellite. The idea behind a solar power satellite is it collects solar energy, transforms it to microwaves, and beams transparent microwaves down to the Earth's surface for gigawatts of free electricity once it's going. This has a lot of issues to be resolved. 
um, the from the engineering side, the, it would use electrical engineers and aeronautical engineers and product development people from the design side. Um, but how to make that work from from the get go is a huge hanging question. Um, another item, though, this could be argued that it could go under the um, uh, crossing crossing the chasm now category or vertical farms. The idea being to build sort of like parking garage structures uh, in cities, but then to garden in them and produce lots and lots of food locally. <clears throat> uh, vertical farms would need more civil and mechanical engineers along with architecture and industrial designers. Um, Elon Musk of SpaceX and Tesla has recently talked about a Hyperloop uh, evacuated tunnel train system. Um, and similar, are, people are starting to talk about a tunnel across the Bering Strait, uh, sort of a mega version of the Channel Tunnel. Um, and these sorts of projects would require, besides staggering capital investment, um, civil and nautical engineers, product designers, probably architects and graphic designers as well. Um, similar uh, floating cities, another thing people talk about periodically. Um, those would be, you know, you need nautical engineers, probably mechanical as well, um, but you need architects, landscape architects, product designers to help make all that work in any conceivable, realistic way. Um, a little closer to home, um, <laughs> a little closer to home, but no equi not not no easier of a hurdle is uh, designs for grasshopper hutch. Um, some industrial designers have produced one that works, so the the development part of it is taken care of. It's largely functional. Um, the question is, how do you get Americans to eat bugs? Um, Last on these um, would have to be the metric system. Um, and this shows that sometimes these chasms are purely cultural inertia and policy and not necessarily a design question or an architectural or, or an engineering question or even a biomedical question. And that there are these cultural forces. And even if it makes sense in this case to switch to a decimal based measuring system, it's not going to happen, or maybe it will happen, and we can figure a way to engineer and design our way through it. So a couple of concluding thoughts. Design and engineering can and should be the two great tastes that taste great together. Um, they traditionally work hand in hand, and um, it's good to see engineers spreading their knowledge and designers sharing theirs. So designers often can bring new materials, um, making techniques and processes into projects that they willingly share. Um, engineers, in my experience, bring a lot of discipline, immense capabilities for constructing real world things that are functional, and um, unprecedented levels of quantitative analysis on a project. Um, one last thing from working in multidisciplinary teams, um, language and terms are very important, especially early on. Uh, if, if, everybody's in, if everybody on a team is from inside the same skill set, they don't need to because they already speak each other's language. If they're related skill sets, probably the same, but not always. And then if they're very different fields, so say design and engineering or engineering and medicine or take your pick, um, computer science and engineering, you're going to have a lot of differences in language and it's best to try and discover and resolve those early rather than later. So in conclusion, Design offers uh, many capabilities for crossing the chasm. Design especially offers complementary skills to all fields of engineering. And it's often just a question of 
teasing those capabilities out, um, especially on a team-by-team -team basis. And with that, thank you very much for listening to this whole lecture. Um, if this is a Brown class, your TAs will be Skyping in, and otherwise, thank you very much. Anybody, feel free to contact me with any questions. Thank you.